Hi, and welcome back to Allen High School and Pre-AP Chemistry. We're studying the laboratory, the basics that we need to build upon in order to do some good experimentation. We are talking about the scientific method at this point, and I want to make sure we make a good distinction between a law and a theory. These are two words that I think are commonly mixed up. And so let's make sure we have them clear in our mind. The first is a law. A scientific law is a concise factual statement that says that something happened. Not why, it just says that an event occurs or that there is a cause and effect. Um, that we saw, like for example in the previous video we saw that as you decrease temperature you decrease the pressure of a gas. That turns out to be a law. It doesn't say why the pressure decreases with decreasing temperature, it just says that it happens. So it's a statement of fact um, that's meant to be proven by observation time and time again. So it has to be developed from a hypothesis that's been tested many, 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 many times, okay, before we would remotely consider calling it a law. There's not a whole lot of laws on the books in chemistry because of that, okay? Now, a scientific theory, on the other hand, is an attempt to explain or justify and build models for that scientific events that we're seeing. Okay, so we want to look at some sort of physical phenomenon and explain why it happens. What's going on at the molecular level that helps us know? So theories are going to often include facts and laws, but it's not like a theory grows up to be a law. They're two separate things. So we have the theory of evolution is a possible explanation for why the world around us is the way it is. The theory of relativity from Einstein, atomic theory that we'll spend time on. Quantum theory, it's a mathematical and modeling method to try to understand the atom. So they're theories that has um, a strong explanatory ability. Now, you know what, all these theories are well documented and they say they're proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, you know what, I'm not sure I agree with that statement. I think that there's still much to be done in theories and, and I would hesitate that they've been proven beyond a theory of a doubt. Theories can be tweaked and I know that was from a good reference. Um, that's just my take on it. Theories can be tweaked and changed and I, it is true that they're, that they're typically um, not replaced, but they're not true beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I would disagree with that. I'll have a talk with the other teachers on it. All right, now variables in experimentation. Uh, when we design, I forgot to set the timer so I don't go too long winded on you here. Um, when we design experiments, uh, we need to pay close attention to the variables, the quantities that can be changed and varied and manipulated. Let's go back to our decrease temperature, decrease pressure example. Well, both temperature and pressure are called variables, but they're not the only variables. Temperature is not the only thing that affects the pressure of a gas. There are other quantities. The volume of the gas can impact the, the pressure. Uh, the, the amount of gas in the system, the type of gas, the nature of the gas can affect how temperature affects the pressure. So we want to design a system in which one variable is manipulated, one variable is measured, and everything else is controlled. Now this is different from a control group. There's a kind of a vague idea that's like the same underlying each, but it's different from a control group. Now, I don't know why, if I knew why, I would find a better way to teach this, but students have trouble with these concepts. And I think it's easiest to look at an experiment and ask yourself, what is being measured? I think it's easiest to find the dependent variable first. That's the variable that is going to be measured in response to, you know, us as scientists making changes and doing manipulations. 
okay? So it is going to be made, it's the cause or result of, it's caused by or is the result of. So changes in the independent variable that were made by the scientist cause a result in, is a better word, sorry, result in a change in the dependent variable, okay? So those are your final results. It's a measurement, okay? Now, once you've found that, it becomes a little bit easier to say, okay, well, what did I manipulate? What did I select? So the independent is the manipulated variable. And then everything else we want to be kept constant. Otherwise, we won't know whether the measurements we take on the dependent was due to temperature or volume, unless the volume is kept constant. Okay, remember, it's different than a control group. Now, a way to help remember these is to remember the phrase dry mix. Dry mix stands for dependent variable, the dependent variable is the resulting variable, and it's almost always on the y-axis. One exception would be we typically put time on the x-axis, whether it's the independent or dependent. Go figure, okay? But that's how it's done. And then the manipulated or manipulating variable is your independent and we graph that on the x-axis. So that's a good way to determine that. Now, we don't always graph our data, so that doesn't always help, but remember, dependent resulting, manipulated independent, I think can help you out. And if you can come up with a good phrase, share it with the class. Okay, we're going to do some examples of these, but in the meantime, I'm gonna wait for the next video for that. And until I see you again, this is signing off.